Hello and welcome to Lofty Pursuits and Public Displays of Confection in Tallahassee, Florida, where we make hard candy. Thanks for coming by. Today we're going to make some banana hard candy with a picture of a banana on each of the about 1,500 pieces of candy we're going to make. I've already added the banana flavoring to my candy pot, and I'm going to pour it on my candy cooling table. This table was made in 1891. We have a video for that you can look up. And it cools the sugar down very quickly and lets us do what we need to do with it. The sugar is amber, but we're still going to have to add yellow food coloring to make it look yellow. We're going to boil out all the water in the food coloring so it doesn't get sticky. Banana flavoring in candy is an odd thing in most candies. Now in our candy, it tastes unlike you may have ever tasted in a candy. It tastes like a real banana. That's because we use natural flavors. But in most candies, it's an artificial taste that's not entirely banana-like. You may ask yourself, why did they get an artificial flavor that doesn't taste like a banana? So as we cut up the sugar into three colors, we have a yellow, we have a brown, we have an amber that'll later become white. Let's talk about the history of bananas. Bananas were first cultivated almost 10,000 years ago in Papua New Guinea. And they had big seeds, unlike modern bananas. And there are still wild bananas that have these. But they bred the seeds out and eventually started using cutoffs or clones of the plant to grow other plants. The candy is cooled unevenly. The bits that touch the bars and the metal bottom of the table, well, it's all cool. It can actually be handled fairly easily, but the center is still a blistering hot swimming pool. So we pour out that bit and we fold the candy together until it hits a consistent temperature. Eventually a temperature too hot for us to handle without heavy gloves. We want to make the uncolored candy white. And we do this by pulling it over a hook again and again and trapping tons of air bubbles that reflect the light back. It makes the candy a nice bright white. If you haven't figured it out, here at Lofty Pursuits we like bananas. It's not just the 7 foot fiberglass banana that's hanging behind me right now. It's a key piece for making our great banana splits and other old soda fountain treats like merry-go-rounds and royales and skyscrapers. And of course, it's not only the history of candy that it's tied to, it's the history of the American soda fountain. In North America, bananas became very popular at the end of the American Civil War and they kept on increasing in popularity and companies started breeding bananas that were of one type, this monoculture. The most popular one was called the Gross Michael or Fat Michael and it was a spectacular banana by all accounts and it was the number one banana worldwide. That was until 1950 when Panama disease came. And Panama's disease came and infected the bananas and because all the bananas were the same and they were all susceptible to it, it spread like wildfire. It completely decimated the banana industry. Now, the Gross Michael is not extinct and you can still find it sometimes, but it had a harsher flavor than our modern Cavendishes that have a very subtle and more complicated flavor. The modern banana has more overtones, but it's a more mild banana. Artificial flavors for candies started at about the same time the bananas became popular. And because of this, the artificial banana flavor was based off the banana of the time, the Gross Michael. Well, they still make it that way because that's what people expect candy to taste like. So you're actually tasting a bit of the past. Now, I've tasted a Gross Michael, and frankly, I think the artificial flavor is still a little artificial. But it definitely did have a different flavor, and the different flavor is not what we have today with the Cavendish. And that's what makes our banana flavoring different. It tastes like a modern banana with all of its complexities and overtones. And now to build our banana in candy, and the first thing we have to do is blend some white and some yellow so we can get some opaque yellow. If you're ever driving by Tallahassee, we're about five minutes off I-10. Please come and visit. You can see us in person, and some days we're making candy. We don't have a regular schedule, but we'd love to see you anyway, and we serve an amazing breakfast, a great lunch, and of course, candy and ice cream. What could be better? You can even check out our toys. We didn't show the coloring of the brown candy in this video, but we made some brown candy for the outline of the banana, and we make a nice square of it, and then we roll two cylinders of the yellow we just made inside. And this is going to be the basis of the banana. Now we carefully flatten it a bit and we put it on a hot spot on our heating table and we just wait and gravity will do the rest, making it very banana-like over time. Now we need to add the curve to our banana. Unfortunately, the banana is still soft enough so we can bend it around this white cylinder we just made. The Cavendish banana that I grew up with is now having the same problem that the Gross Michael had. A new disease is coming up that's threatening it. And we gotta see, we may not have bananas in the future. 
And that's a problem. Bananas are the fourth largest cultivated crop in the world. And they're only after rice, corn, and wheat. Um, it is a major food source for the entire planet. And because of the single monoculture, it's at risk at all times. It would be a much sadder place if the world did not have banana splits. Now that we've wrapped the banana in its white hot sugar, all that's left is to do the outside wrap in yellow. I've always thought that the yellow wrap is what gives our banana candy its great appeal. A banana plant is an odd thing. It's actually the largest flowering herb in the world. And by herb, I mean a plant that does not have a woody stem. Now we size down and pinch off one end and taper the candy. That end gets cut off and gets saved. We sell it in the store under the name Unicorn Droppings, and if you ever come by, you can get one for yourself. We don't sell it online at this point. Then we pull our logs into rods and let them cool. And this is the staging point before we cut them into individual pieces of candy. I feel we don't look back at our own history enough. This is one of the reasons I run a vintage soda fountain and I make vintage candy. And when I was researching my soda fountain, I found this book from 1947 by the Chiquita Banana Company. It included Chiquita rolls, using bananas with meat, things we wouldn't eat. But it taught some cool things about bananas and how you should deal with them. The book taught me a lot of things, but the biggest thing it taught me that surprised me was I was peeling bananas wrong. All these years, I've been peeling bananas wrong, and of course you'll ask now, how can you peel a banana wrong? The answer is you're peeling it from the wrong end. You should start from the flower end instead of from the stem end. You see, if you start from the flower end, all those little strands that are sort of fibrous, they stay with the skin. If you start with the stem ends, they stay with the banana. So by pe peeling it from the flower end, the little black end, you end up avoiding all of those annoying little threads of banana. And if you ever get a chance, monkeys peel it this way too. So how can it be wrong? Who's a better expert at bananas? As some of you know, I used to be a commercial artist and I've done some portraiture. The thing I find about bananas is their symmetry is strange. What I'm talking about is if you look at yourself in the mirror and you draw a line from your nose to your belly button and sort of divide yourself that way, both halves are sort of a mirror image of each other. Some creatures have more divisions than that, and some plants do, but they're usually an even number. Bananas are an odd number. They're trilaterally symmetrical. And if you apply pressure from one end, the banana will split into three parts on its own. Now all that's left to do is take our rods of banana candy and cut it up into bite-sized pieces, which we ship all over the world. Bananas have become a part of our culture. If you take a look at fine arts, you can see a banana on the cover of the Velvet Underground album. Andy Warhol actually got the banana he modeled it off off the counter of a soda fountain that he frequented in New York City. You can see it in uh, the stage. The term top banana comes from a role that a comic had where he was handed a banana. This joke became so common that it became a term for the lead comic. And of course you can see it in music, and that I sort of have a tie to. My great uncle Murray Sturm uh, was a Tin Pan Alley writer, and the family legend is he was one of the people who worked on the song Yes We Have No Bananas. He didn't get credit if he did work on it, and I'm not sure if that story is true or not, but it is a banana story, and I'm gonna stick with it. And the song Yes We Have No Bananas may be prophetic. Think about it. If bananas die out because it's a monoculture and this disease attacks it, we may have no bananas, so let's enjoy them while we can. And when the candy is cut, you can clearly see the shape of the banana inside each piece. We did have a problem with this batch. Our flavor tester, Larry, was out. So we had to ask for volunteers. And we're very thankful for our customers who pitched in with this hard problem of tasting our candy and letting us know if they liked it or not. They liked it. We appreciate you watching our video. If you liked it, please subscribe to us here on YouTube. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you want to try this candy for yourself, it's available at www.pd.net on our website. You can even visit us in person in Tallahassee, Florida. We're called Lofty Pursuits, and we're right off I-10 in Tallahassee. Thank you for watching. We'll hope to see you in Tallahassee someday.